All right, so now we're back in part two of the advanced stuff. Um, does does anybody have uh, anything in particular they were um, getting stuck on with web scraping or have questions about what we just covered? Um, event listeners, they were they were hard for me at first. Now, um, I'm not gonna say they're quote unquote easy, but I, at least I have a plan on how to tackle them. You know, when something comes up, when I try to click something and it doesn't work, I, I, I know a process to try to deal with it. Yeah, and that's that's often the thing. And, and what might one might say that uh, our hot key uh, with the size of our community and the amount of code that's out there, of course, over the years, more and more has come, but compared to the really big uh, players like C++ or Python or Java or whatever they might be called, all of them, we don't have nearly as many sure. whatever public libraries and no. other different stuff. And and of course, the reason that stuff like Rails or Python's, whatever it all might be called, has libraries to do web scraping or to do web automation or whatever it might be, is of course just to ease everybody's uh, learning curve, it might be. Uh, to me, sometimes it, it seems a little weird to build an entire uh, library to do a thing that, that, uh, that that's already built in. Th that's what I talked about at one point when people kept building libraries to automate um, Excel. Yeah. So they had uh, maybe a hundred functions to do a specific Excel uh, functionality. But it wasn't complex functionality. It was just, I have a function to input something in a specific cell. Oh, mercy. Uh, yeah. And I, yeah. I was like, yeah, that's, that's great. But <laughs> this line here does the exact same thing. And they weren't really saving many characters or yeah. anything. And they might have very specific parameters for their need. And it was OK to have a library like that for yourself, but sharing it and hoping for everybody else to use it was just mm, not really that yeah. useful. Yeah. But I'm still half embarrassed. I, I have an Excel library. Half the stuff is decent. Half the stuff is like you described, right? Mm -hmm. Like I built it before I knew what I was doing and, and it works, but it's quirky. Um, and it, you know, and actually some of the stuff doesn't work. But I, I just, you know, I don't have the time to go back and see what works and what doesn't work. I just don't care, right? It, it, the, the majority of stuff works, but yeah, I, I hear you. Um, and speaking of numbers, so this was, there was almost 3 million people in my network for Python. Um, and there's, you know, not quite 4,000 um, for AutoHotKey, right? I mean, it just goes to show you the, the number of people on LinkedIn, right? And Python is insane, um, <laughs> the, the size of that community. Yeah. Yeah, and, and well, of course, they'll produce way more stuff than we, yeah. than the, and mm, I, I know a lot of people who's, who have been programming, maybe even, maybe not everybody has done it for a long time, but at one point you get to a point where strictness, 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 is that, mm -hmm. is that a yeah. correct word? But where you have a strict typed language, you might have many people who build scripts, libraries, and code in the same way, or at least in, in, a, in a more strict way. So it's more easy for someone else to actually come in and use their stuff. So yeah, a, a community can benefit from that. And as, as has been mentioned many times over without a hotkey is that, yeah, we have this more loose way of doing it. You can use functions, you can use commands you can yep. or whatnot you can use commas and you can not and you can use equal signs or colon equal signs and, and there's a lot of ways of doing stuff and it might help a newbie <laughs> that's I, I don't know if i like that word but still to feel like hey i can get something running quite easily mm -hmm. but f going from from the new user to the me medium user might actually be harder 
because in a community like ours, you may not feel like you have that many helping libraries to just do the stuff. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Instead of in, oh, I want to do web scraping, and in Python, you would just be pointed to two block libraries that you need yeah. to use. Whereas yeah. here, you'd be pointed to Calm, which of course is a complete <laughs> um, understanding perhaps of, of how uh, Microsoft implement or at least put out uh, a model of how to actually mm -hmm. program common objects, which is of course a giant topic well, compared yeah. to just being told, hey, use that. But I, well, the, the, actually well, the one thing I would say in there though is the nice thing about it is once you, you get it, you can jump between Microsoft programs, right? I can switch to Outlook or Excel or Word um, and, and IE. Um, and granted, they all have different functions and methods, but it's still, it, a lot of it carries over, right? Versus if you're using, let's say, Beautiful Soup in Python, and then you go to do something else, another one, like it, they may be totally unrelated in how they, they work. Um, so I do like that with Auto Hotkey is that it's, I have one approach to everything from Microsoft, not everything, close to everything. Yeah, yeah, we, we got something from Susan. I don't want to oh. do want to read it yourself. But to talking about, as, to me, using calm the way that that is common, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, but using the dot t syntax, so everything looks as if you're, you're writing JavaScript, which is again, a very popular method of, of doing this. So you can look up examples like crazy online and actually get code that almost works out of the box. And to me, that, that's a great tool for, or a great asset of doing it the way that it was originally intended, instead of someone writing like, what's it called? The one you have a tutorial on to do some web scraping stuff. Um, mm, Joe, help me here. I'm, I'm forgetting. I don't know. I got a lot. Uh, uh, to do calm stuff, you used this library. It's called something. You had a tutorial on it. I'm, I'm trying to think. It. Um, completely, I, I'm completely blank. The DOM, but you're not talking about the DOM. I mean, no, no. Used a library on it. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, Selenium. That. Oh, sorry. That's, okay. that's yeah. a library. Yeah, and then Chrome, Geek, Geek Dudes, Chrome also. Yeah. Yeah, but that's that's a new thing. Yeah. Again, Geek Dudes Chrome is again actually hitting Chrome, and you oh. use commands that Chrome is built with. Where no. Selenium is some people sitting somewhere. I don't want to write get element by ID. Hey, that's what it's called in the actual code that the developers made. No, no, here we're going to call it um, fetch uh, element by um, identification. Whatever it is, I can't remember the exact things, but they changed ever yeah. so slightly every yeah. small command. Yeah. They, it, it, to well, me, it just seems unnecessary. Yeah. I actually, if I remember right, because I haven't used it in quite a while, but when I did my stuff in Selenium, I rewrote it so it used the things I was familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. I put it back into my own context because, like you said, like they slightly changed it and you're like, I, God, I don't know. Like I always get it wrong. So I made functions that said like get element by ID and then I, you know, I put in the ID and I didn't have to worry about it because um, yeah. it was ridiculous. Like, yeah, how long has this been around? And they're like, hey, we'll just make our own. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, of course, I get it because sometimes it makes sense because they might be making something that's cross, um, uh -huh. cross browser or whatever it might be. Uh, but again, even the, the big browsers today use uh, as near as they can get to each other comparable uh, code um, or at least methods if you use a look at JavaScript and other stuff like that. It's amazing that they can stay with the same naming convention across right. but yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, it's so, just a small rent. Yeah. So Susan was asking about um, trouble one troubleshooting around errors. Let's let's pick it apart because actually, and I want to make sure um, that that um, she was mentioning that she they had to defend the macro. Um, I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So basically, someone had written a macro, um, and then I'm going to guess other users were using it, and there were some problems with the data. But then it sounds like when you actually investigated it, it was the human error, not not the the macro that was causing the problem. But um, you know, and and it might be before we actually get into your question, I'm thinking about the the cause of like, you know, what it reminds me of. You're going to laugh at this. Um, it was the funniest thing when I was growing up. Um, cruise control was a new thing, right? Like mm -hmm. when I was in high school, and I remember people talking about it. And apparently, some people were crashing because especially like like Mexicans who didn't have a great grasp of the English language, right? And the salespeople were basically telling them, oh, it's it's like a, an autopilot. You can just get up and, and do whatever, right? You know, you, you said it and it just, and so people were literally thinking like, oh, whatever, I said it, I don't have to worry about it. Um, but I, I, I wonder if like a macro for some people think, oh, I don't have to do any, I don't have to think at all, right? This is gonna take care of it. And I don't have, I can be brain dead. And it's like, no, that's, that's not, you know, unless you, you guys built in a, you know, a ton of error checking, right? Which, which to me, I, I usually don't do. I, I automate something where I can screen it real quickly if I want um, before I hit submit or do whatever. Um, but you can also, so, so to your question, I'd say is absolutely you can build in logical things of what you would expect to get, you know, a value and have it raise errors and alert you if, if they don't match up. Um, to what you what you can add logic to the problem is often there are things you don't realize right you know it's like it it takes a while to pin down exactly the right logic of what you should and can expect for you know a certain thing to do um, which is why I don't normally do it it just takes me too much time and I'd rather have a little human interaction where I just look at it and, and can say yeah it's fine um, but I, I've had some go off the rails a little um, didn't cause too many big problems, but it, um, it definitely can happen. It's just, you gotta, um, when you're not the one driving, I think, uh, I, I guess it becomes much more critical that you do have something there because, um, you can't make sure that you are proofing it and making sure that it is right. Do you have anything to add to that, Jackie, as far as the defending yeah. it and making sure that the data is correct? Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm listening to what you are saying and rereading the question and trying to to pick, uh, as you said yourself, pick it apart a little and and see if there's something in there. And I'm not sure I've actually had to defend a macro before. Um, often I've I've had kept them to myself first, and if I saw the 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 use of actually sharing it with others. I, I do as you did, have it, having it going in a way where I would have checkpoints within the code. Yep. And when I had seen enough um, things where I saw it to be at 100% correctness, then I might skip that check at some point. Uh, up until I had something that I at least believed to be uh, working 100%. And I might have been lucky and, and or whatever it might have been, but that has worked quite well for me to, to someone has not yet found a fault with that system when I've done it like that. But to having, having actually to defend, and I might not, completely understand how you would defend it if it's actually after the fact that you're defending it or if it's before i think it's 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 my my um reading into this is that they were they were all gung-ho people using it and then they had a macro and then let's skip back the whole past the whole why there were problems but there are problems and now some people are saying hey should we really use macros there's a problem here Right? Should we really automate this? It's not safe, right? There's issues. Mm -hmm. um, and even though it sounds like they've pinpointed and said actually it was the human should have done something, um, it, it still it, it begs the question of like, should we be doing using macros at all? I don't, my guess is it's not, 
Yeah, I mean, obviously it's this particular one, but it, it might be the even taking a step back further, right? And shouldn't use any at all. And uh, and and I think part of it is you got to say, look, it's not a turn off your brain. You know, usually it's not right. You can build that into it and have it stop and have it alert you and do whatever. But um, and and that's so part of your question is about the whole how do you have it flag? The other great thing I would say is to um, start logging your data, right? Because it's so easy to to have it log to a separate file somewhere of the transaction, like what you did, what happened, what was captured. Um, it's just a great, easy way to help safeguard and help. And then you have a log file that you can go look at and see um, separate entirely from whatever you're doing, right? Of how often it looks like the data was corrupted or, or anything like that. But definitely the, training. The thing, uh, and I might be going uh, a little off, but uh, to me, it's it's often also a matter of someone else looking at the macro as kind of a black box that's doing something, uh, maybe not magical, but it's at least doing something outside of their control. And and as soon as it fails, just a little bit, they'll immediately jump it, like people with pitchforks and say, hey, that's that's also, that's a, that's not good enough. We, we can't use that. It's taking away whatever. Um, I believe you had some bosses at one point who had an opinion uh, to that effect that, hey, please don't use macros. Yeah. And, and it's like, but why? It, it's speeding up my work. But I'm saying don't use them. And... Um, <laughs> They might not really have that good of a reason. And as you said yourself, you wanted to defend the use of it. But what is the actual argument? Oh, hmm. Yeah, I, I'm losing the words for it. But I can't see the argument against them if they are truly not at fault. Right, yeah. It's it's one of those. It, it just sounds like there's, you know, someone realized it's not turn off your brain. I've automated it entirely, which is more like a robotic process automation, right? Where you automate the entire process in, except for in very rare cases, you have a human reviewing it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the majority of what we do, I do isn't like that. It's, it's more, I automate a process that I still review with a human or I can, you know, I can, it's not a risky thing, like whatever I'm doing, I can look at it and see like, oh, actually this thing had gotten sideways here and it was doing something a little bit different. Um, but um, and, and Brad, I think it was Brad, or maybe it was Susan. Susan, yeah, Susan said about logging data. Um, and then um, Brad, how should I set up log? Oh, actually they were both talking about. It. So basically, you know, there's a, there's several different ways to auto hotkey. The easiest one that, that I would say is you're just, you're writing out your data. Uh, I use often file append, which um, depending on how many times you're you're doing things, file append every time you call it is going to write to that file, so it opens the file, writes your you know line or whatever or row or whatever you want of data, and then closes it. Um, so if I was looping over you know 10 million things, I probably wouldn't want to use file append because it keeps pinging it over and over and over and over. Um, having said that, if your script um, is in a loop that sometimes crashes and you don't know where it was, it doesn't keep running. Um, that's the beauty of it, right? Is like you want it to keep pushing out to that log file um, during the loop. Otherwise, um, which is what Maestro typically does when he builds things is he, he gets a bunch of data and then when you close the file, it'll dump it all in one big use of the file object normally, but you can still use file append, it doesn't matter. You could be building it in memory and just write once to the log file. And that's what you would just, what I like to do is to have a flat file where one, one row equals one thing I did. And let's say, like when I used to work in email marketing, I would have a, a contact list of people that I had to upload to the server to then send a certain email to the creative, like you know, the actual email itself, um, and then the date it was to deploy. So I had automated that process. What I could have done was... Um, Right when that happened, it would write a log file saying, hey, at this, at 4.15 on 10.16, you know, time, I uploaded 487 contacts to um, this campaign, greet, meet the engineer, um, and maybe I guess it would say like success, like it was actually saved on the server, 
right? That would be one row. And then the next row would be the next thing that I, I pushed up there. Um, that That's the, you know, one way. The other way is just even with like any file, you could, you could use that. I wouldn't necessarily use that, but um, it's an easy way to, I, I guess, nah, I'd stick with the file append or file object for, for writing to it. Did you have any thoughts on that, Jackie? Um, I, I'm with you on that. And of course you can do logs in many ways, but um, uh, if you're doing something and it's very fast and, and a lot of stuff is going on, still use the file object and then just you move the pointer along as you paste into it, and but just keep the object open, whereas file append would open and close the file each time, and it, yeah. it takes a little bit more resources. Yeah. But it's still the same thing. Keep making log entries as you go on. But the thing is that if whatever is the starting product and the completed ended product, if you can't actually log where whatever is off, with the end product, if, if it, all the steps happen, but at some place, the code is wrong, the entry is wrong, the data is mishandled, or a user input uh, something differently, it, it's, it's very hard to actually log those things where the code actually did what is was told to do. Yeah. But something in the completed product is not as was expected. That, that's the hard part to actually log. Yeah, yeah because, and that's where, um, so what you, I get what you're saying, Jackie, and I, I totally agree with you. Um, so what you, what you can do are the, you can log what you had like in your variables, right? If that, if that in any way is helpful to say, well, I tried to set you know, on this thing, this value, um, but maybe there's no way to actually detect that, which is, I think, what you were saying, right? There's no, mm -hmm. actually, I don't have an easy way to do it. But you know what? Hey, I can still log and say, what was my variable at that point, right? Which it, it still might help you understand, like, man, that wasn't at all what I, what it should have been, right? We, it yeah. had a totally wrong, I had a number there and it should have been the name of a person. Um, it it yeah, isn't yeah. As ideal, but it, it, it can help. Uh, one of the at the moment I have something big running on a lot of people's computers and it's of course keeping a log both a, a real-time log and and some other stuff and and as soon as it it hits something that needs to debug of one type of other a lot of stuff is built in but yeah you you can actually have it log quite a lot of information like what line is it on what function it is it in what value does it currently have in whatever variable it might be. So as you said yourself, if you have something that you think you have built from the data, whatever it might have been, and you believe that that's what you're pasting into the completed product, why, why not log that? Mm -hmm. So at a later time, if, if this is wrong because it's handled multiple times in different steps, why not lock the value before the change step happens and have that? It depends on the amount of data. But yeah, I'd say you have this string, then you change that word, you lock the string with that word changed. Then the next time when you change something over here, you lock that as well. You have everything in the completed thing, but up until there, you actually log each step that you do or each time you change whatever it is that you change you log it right before changing it so so at, at the end this is just for testing this is for error correcting this is so that you can go in yourself afterwards and see but which of my many many steps is actually the one where it ugh, uh, didn't do as i expected and the other one, which um, I think everyone here knows, but just just in case, um, uh, crazily enough, how, here we go. So um, I can I'll I'll double click on this one. If you double click the icon, you'll see the last like rows that were run, mm -hmm. right? And then under view, you can also say variables and their contents. And so, as you're actually troubleshooting, which I don't, I, I think Susan, at some point you talked about 
a couple different things. And one was the troubleshooting, but I think there was also a bit of just understanding, you know, where you're going with things. Um, and, and this is an easy one, obviously using message boxes to show you what your variables and values are, but you can show all your variables and values this way. Um, there's also, is it list, list bars? Is that what it is, Jackie? Yeah, yeah. It'll show you all your, your current variables. Um, yeah. And then both. I, I even believe that Lexico's recently made a function somewhere available on the forum for you to actually get that stuff into a variable. Oh, cool. If you wanted it. Yeah. Just yeah, so you it, could dump it out somewhere. Uh -huh. the and then um, both site and auto hockey studio, and I'm going to guess notepad plus plus, but I, I've never tested it, have um, debugging functionality as well, which when you're, when your issue is more complex, de using a debugger is really helpful. Um, I, I can't stress enough of like inside of a loop where it's jumping around, it can be really helpful because you can literally hit a button and have it step through things and show you your variables. And if you're using objects, show you what's inside them at the time. And it's really insightful of like, wow, you know, now, now I understand why the darn thing is not working because it totally had the wrong value. You know, like it doesn't tell you why, but you can at least understand where it's going amok and then trace back to like why it's not the way you thought it should be. Yeah. And that's, that's where the, this is one that you often end up using, or I at least have used it quite a lot of times, is the simple message box. Here, here I know I have the right value. Yeah. Show it to me in a message box. Down here, I'm not sure if I have the right value. So new message box, if that's still correct. Okay, I know this part works, good. Next, new message box lower in the code after whatever function call or whatever subroutine you had. New message box, show it again. This is a very, it is the same thing as the debugger is doing, but you can just um, jump over way more lines uh, at a time to, to do your initial check of where in the code you actually have. Um, so you can narrow down from, let's say you have a thousand lines of code and you have one at the top and one at the bottom. Okay, you know it was between those. Okay, so you put in one in the middle and that one is still correct. Okay, so now you know it's actually in the end of your, or the last half of your script. Okay, one more in the middle of that. That's the way to actually narrow down where is the thing uh, going astray. So yeah, uh, message box, show whatever is important. And what I'm demonstrating here is um, Maestrith also has a, a function for tooltip. So I, I, he uses it a lot more than I do for troubleshooting. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't use tooltips a lot. But on something that is a process that, you know, you kind of want to watch it flow and you get tired of hitting, okay, you know, move forward. Um, it's an easy way to, you know, show a variable's value as it's going through whatever. Um, so I'll use, we also, by the way, have a webinar on debugging, right? And, and, yeah, troubleshooting. Yeah. Yeah. and we walk through, you know, some of the best, easiest ways. And it's, I think it's, it's, it's kind of ironic, right? Because the vast majority of people using our hotkey don't, don't use any sort of a debugger. They use message boxes for 99% of everything. And yet mm -hmm. it, it's something, if I could encourage people that just start using auto hotkey to spend, you know, some time at learning how to debug their entire life using auto hockey would be so much better because suddenly you have tool. It's kind of like that visual events thing, right? With in, in event listeners, I finally learned how to troubleshoot. How do I can figure out to work around these event listeners? Cause before I didn't have any sort of tools to work with them. And now suddenly with that um, visual events and using the event listener thing, now I know I can, I can start actually fixing it and, you know, and approaching it. But mm -hmm. um, man, it, um, it's one of those, like, no one wants to start learning how to debug, you know, you want to be working, but it's, it's a critical thing that can be really helpful. Um, yeah. And escape. Yeah. <laughs> Did we get, we got another question from Brad, I think. Uh, yeah, um, Cat was, he actually gave us a couple examples already. Um, Okay. Okay. But yeah. yeah, just to kind of mention it, he 
actually asked for, he had some issues with his code interfering with his wife's work, right? And he wanted a way to what end all of the other hotkey scripts that were running or something like that. Does that sound about right for what he was actually asking? Yeah. About? And Kevin Oden, he posted something that does that. Well, he, he got one that gave you a list of all, it actually closed all the, the first one closed all of the um, running auto hotkey scripts. Fair enough. So this will this will get a list of them go through and uses the win close to go through and close them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I said, hey, couldn't, I think there's actually a way to pause them, right? And then he, I think that's, I didn't look at the second one, um, but it sounds like there might be a, a problem with it, but um, that would go through and pause them which to me, that way I can, I don't have to restart them, right? I can just um, draw yeah, them back to me, on. it would, would also depend on whatever it is that actually is. So, yeah, and actually, Brad, the other, I, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you guys don't log in as different people. Is that right? Because you, you could, um, you could build stuff to run, yeah, okay, in a certain way where if you just had a different login, even if the things were running, they wouldn't actually work because it can check your computer name, right? Um, well, that's not the username on the username. computer. And, um, yeah, but but again, depending on what it is, if it's simple hotkeys that's interfering with her work or hot strings or whatever, I'd use one of the if uh, directories to to kind of say, hey, I only want this hotkey to work in this program. Yeah. Or this yeah, so binding it to a given program and that way, only if you're in like, let's say Chrome and you hit your hotkey, does it work? And that way, when she's in Word and she hits the hotkey, it doesn't interfere with it. That, that's a great suggestion, Jackie. Is yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm just guessing. It depends on what, how it's actually interfering. Because if she works in the same programs as him, oh. but she doesn't want to have access. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Brad, you're saying, Basically, every time she's using your computer, she's using Citrix to connect to another computer, right? Um, so what you could just do is basically bind everything you have to say, hey, if Citrix is active, don't don't use anything. You know, don't have any of the hotkeys do anything. Yeah, if if it's hotkeys or hot strings, that's the issue. Yep. If, if it's just because a script is running, doing stuff, that's of course not. Um, it just used the if when active, um, Jackie, do you know this off the top of your head? So he wants to have it set up. So if when active, um, if, is there if, if not when active? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If not active, and how does that go? It depends. If this is, uh, <laughs> if you want the hotkeys to work when something is not active or doesn't exist or whatever it might be. But the interesting is, is the, what's, what's it called? The, the square? Okay. Is, is it the square? That's the pound sign? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. The pound sign, yeah. Uh, it, it needs to be the commands with the pound sign in front of them. The yeah. actual, uh, so let's let's pretend Chrome is is the is the Citrix. Mm -hmm. Right? So so in here, and let's say actually in here I have um I have actually I have I have several hotkeys, right? Mm -hmm. Um I have one there. Let's let's go ahead and get rid of the, the, actually, there's two there. So up here, we would have if if when not active. Is that what I would yeah, use? Then? Yeah, yeah. Why not? And then it might be as simple as like this. Although I grant now I, that changed, of course. Right now it's auto hotkey, so I have to come back in here, click here. And now it's active. Okay, get that, and now come back to auto hotkey studio and paste, um, and make sure. If you if you want other stuff to stop, if you still if you had, um, this one is only with the scenario of Citrix. If you wanted to make hotkeys that only worked in Chrome, or only worked in IE, or only worked in Word, or only uh, only worked in specific programs, he could yep. use if when active. But here, if he just wants to ex exclude Excellent. all yep. of his keys from something when one specific program is running, and if when active might not even be the right one because Citrix doesn't actually stay active when you work within it. Point. Yeah. So, 
So it might take some playing around, but here's one way. The other cool thing about this is let's say in here I had control G does something. Um, Message box, whatever. Yeah, then you can, you can say this is the stuff, hey, she still wants to have some, right? So you can put the ones you guys both want outside of, of this loop, not loop, but this, I don't know what, what it block. Right, uh -huh. and that way these would still work. But if you wanted everything, then you would just move this up in there, right? And then it, it, it theoretically shouldn't work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's how you can. Um, so what everything. you could do is set up two very simple hotkeys to actually show that it works or doesn't work. I don't know. This is a video after all. Say it again. What? You yeah, I'm just saying. It? Yeah, yeah okay. that's, that's a simple test. Crazy talk. Yeah, oh my God. Um, so uh, and the other thing um, I was gonna say was actually, so back to your point, Jackie, before I do it, um, would we use maybe if win exists then, and that way if Citrix is even running? Yeah, yeah, then, that would be my, my take on it. Okay. So, so right now, let's see, make sure nothing's actually out of this. Let me run it. Okay, and let's see, control G, actually control G, I have a, a hotkey, funny enough. Oh, and it's in there, control G, if we, oh, if we're not active, it's not active, all right, so that mm -hmm. worked. Now let's activate Chrome, control G, oh, nothing, nothing there. Yeah. Magic. And it worked, yeah. and we're live. Yeah, exactly. So that's good. It's, it's not that easy to actually see, but Again, sure. you get yeah. a general idea of these pound sign uh, direct. Is is it called directories? That's that's not correct, right? No, direct I think you're right. That sounds right. Yeah. Correct us. Uh, directives. How's that? Directives. That right? Yeah, directives. That's that's what they're called. Yeah. 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 These directives are quite powerful when it comes to where you want hotkeys and stuff to to actually work and interact. And again, if she starts Citrix as some one of the first things she does, just having that at the top of all of your scripts, if uh, not, if win not exist or whatever the, the wording of it might be, and then just having Citrix as, as the thing, yeah. I, I'm curious, um, Kat Moden chimed in here. It says preprocessor directive. Um, does yeah, that's, that's probably correct, but uh, in within on hotkey, I just think it's called directive. I, I'm but just it, curious if it has a implication to it actually, like um, it, it matter, you know, the, the yeah, I, 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 I think it's, it's the preprocessors directive is just to, to explain when it actually kicks in. So before pre, the process is actually processed, the, the click of the key. Oh, interesting. Before, okay. before Arhat key actually receives. Okay. Yeah, something sure. like that. That's, it has to, otherwise it wouldn't, it wouldn't know which to run when, right? It's gotta, it's gotta look across all those things first, right? Yeah. To, um, to take into account which one is so, to use. So I'd say that when the other hotkey window or whatever, how it works, actually gets the, the event message or what, however that mm -hmm. works. Um, it has these pre-processing directives that tells it, oh, okay, this, this was a control G. Is there any directive that tells me to actually handle or not handle this. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it, it, it pre-processes those before it actually does anything with the information that the key was pressed. Something like that. Is that a good way of saying it? Yeah, I think so. This, by the way, um, back to the troubleshooting the webinar, but we had a lot of good, um, good flow of uh, how to work on things. Mm -hmm. Hot keys or something. Cool. Yeah. And that stress ball there. That's yeah. that's a good thing. 
you know what's amazing? I still think it's amazing is that's actually um, a 3D image, right? This, they didn't have my stress ball. I mm -hmm. paid a company to, 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 to take, I don't, and like, look at that, how they even bent it, right? They did a yeah. great job. Um, but, um, Shadows yeah, we, we talked about the double click in the icon. We talked about both of those. Um, yeah, uh, first off, we start the script, we start the computer, right? It's just Windows. You don't think they just took a ball and put it in the hand of him and then just put out hot key stuff? I don't, no, because no, cause I gave him, I mean, that's my logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think if you take a white ball and put it in a hand and then just move the logo onto it, they, they, I suppose they could have. Whoa. Stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to. Okay, that zoomed in. Yeah, it did. But where'd my picture go? There we go. I, I suppose that's possible because that, they did it. Yeah. Although, I, I don't know. Anyway. No, I, I don't know either. I'm, I'm just guessing. Yeah, because it's a good guess. Fingers and stuff is maybe still a little bit off. But uh, sometimes you just want to find faults. So they yeah. Might just yeah, the text, I think, I think you might be right. This, this should have been a little more rounded. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't quite look like it. So maybe you're right. Yeah. It's just yeah. guessing. Yeah. Oh, so, um, so Joe at the beginning, I showed how to use stir split to grab the first part of a string and use something. Until, yeah. I, you know what? Um, it's so funny you mentioned that because, and actually I can't remember, maybe it was Jackie or if it was Maestri, if it was one of the two of them showed me that. And, and I'm like, that's not anywhere documented. And I'm like, it, it is one thing that blew my mind. Um, I totally agree that, um, it looks like I already closed. Let me see if I get this right. Um, that was SBSS. Why is it not? Oh, anyway, Maestri uses his thing so much better than I do. Um, PBS scripts. Why is it not listed? Should have been right like up in here. Oh, it's right there. Yeah, so I, I totally agree that like this isn't you know, and if I wanted the second one, right, I can do that, or the third one, I can do that. So it's a, um, this is a function, right? The, the stir split's a function. And I can, I can say, hey, give me the, I don't even have to store this in a variable. What I used to do was use, you know, like string split, save it as a variable, and then say, give me the fourth one. And this allows me to, I don't even have to save this as a variable. I can, I mean, here I do, because I'm pasting it to the clipboard. So it's a it's a bad example because I'm pasting the clipboard. But normally, if I actually had a, a I want to use it as a parameter and a function, I wouldn't have to store it as a variable. I can just call it, and it it it. Tell me, correct me here, Jackie, if I'm saying it right. It'll it'll process it without actually even storing that variable in memory, and so it it uses it and it's gone, and it doesn't take up, like you know, not that resources are really a big. Yeah, deal. the 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 string split function here, it take some parameters and then it returns an object. That object you can do with whatever you want. You could store it in a variable and then you can act on the object afterwards. But here, what you are doing instead, Joe, is that you call the function, then it returns the object. The object is for our eyes here, non-existent, but it is within the memory or within the actual code while it's running. It exists, the object is there. And putting the dot one on the end of the function actually tells the code or the script or our hotkey, whatever you like to say, to fetch the third, just like you would do on any other other hotkey object, the third element from the object. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing is that I don't, I don't know why it's not oh, documented, but it is a thing with how it simply works. Yeah. That, that's perhaps why you would first see it when someone uses it, because you need to first learn how functions and objects in how the hotkey works to actually start using. You might not need to know, but 
you could learn from someone doing it. But as soon as you understand that if you make your own function and make it return an object, you could do this on it. Mm -hmm. This isn't a thing specific for this. It's That's just right. because this function is returning an array or an object, then you can actually on directly like this, call the dot syntax. So you could also call a method or um, whatever it might be on here. And this reminds me, Jackie, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you and I have talked a lot about this because in some posts, people will be like, hey, but that's using an object and that takes up more memory. So you should use a, a command, uh, what is it, a, not a command. Yeah, yeah, a command. That's command, right. and that way it's faster and this and that. And it's like, the, you know, the, the, the speed and everything is so ridiculous and the difference um, in memory, it's so tiny. And yet this is so clean and easy and it's in one line. And I don't even, I could even put, you know, I can put um, a, a comma here and do it again if I wanted to, right? And do whatever. So I can, yeah, I can change again, the that's, order. That's the extra functionality of the comma. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's also something that you don't see all that often, but yeah. So, Oh, right sorry. now, I do believe that you are doing some something with the message box because you're putting commas in there and stuff. Yeah. And the message box actually acts on commas in in. in oh, thank you, thank you. And other stuff. Yeah. So I, I should throw in some some spaces in between these, right? Probably. There we go. So I just changed the order. My this is, right? To take the third thing on with the space and then the first one and the second one mm -hmm. um, but it, it's it's pretty cool because I can I can call them all in a row and I don't have to have each one separate um, again once they're used they're gone they're not stored in memory mm -hmm. um, and, and then man that saved me so much typing um, and saving and then reusing of variable names and all the stuff and, and, and you can put it in a function like if you have a, a function you're using and as one of the parameters, you can just dump it in there. Um, and it's just like, man, it's, it's, it's really nice. But this is where, where you can really start saving code is when, when you learn to use this type of way of doing it, you would almost Sean, Sean, I know, stray away from using commands because this way of using functions just becomes so much easier you can use it straight up within an expression as soon yeah. as you want it. Instead of you first having to call a command in, in whatever way to, to split the string, now you can just do it straight up within the function or within another function call. You could do this within one of the parameters. Just, yeah. Um, by the way, Alice. Let me let me put this out here real quick. So Dallas, Texas, we'll say Toyota Echo um, eight percent, and what was the last thing? Um, I don't know. I think maybe it was a maybe it was a, a price. I was doing some some web scraping. Actually, I was doing some app scraping. I was scraping data out of an Android um, app, and um, I had it, what was interesting was the text I was getting didn't always break in exactly a full group. And so let's say this was a car, right? So it was a, um, it was located in Dallas, Texas, Toyota Echo, 8% um, was how much gas was actually in the car. And then this is the price they rented for the car. And then we'd have another one, you know, after it, like like here, but sometimes like this broke like this, right? Or, or the last one continued on. And so it wasn't quite that. So I was writing and I did a pretty good job. I wrote a regular expression to look for certain things in parse get what I wanted out of this. Um, there was something a little odd in it and I couldn't put my finger on it, but Maestrith was helping me automate some stuff. And so, well, he looks at it and he goes, well, you know, the only thing in this is going that's gonna have a percent sign is this thing. So let's use the percent sign to split off of, and then he split it off by the percent sign first and then he backed up two lines and then went forward one line. And he didn't use a regular expression at all, he just, use stir split to find basically in like an index and then moved, you know, up and down lines. And I'm like, it was so much more reliable than what I did and straightforward and clear. And yet it just like never crossed my mind of like using stir split to, 
to grab these parts of the text and break them out. And that was just one of those things, like I love watching other people do stuff because like now that that's in my head and that's why I brought it up is like, next time something like this comes up, it's like, hey, what is unique, right? What's different here? What can you actually um, find that's unique? And then and then basically how can you identify that and split it and then, and then manipulate around it? But um, there's so many different ways to do things, right? And we all think differently. And then as of course, what's in your toolbox? What have you used before? But it never would have dawned on me to use stir split to to have parsed this this data. No, and and as you mentioned a moment ago, at least uh, this this thing with um, a command having a, a smaller overheat or whatever it was, it, I had a discussion with with someone on the forum at one point about it, and. Of course, it's worth knowing that one is heavier on your system than yeah. the other. But if you look at the script that Joe is showing right now on the screen, if you use string split two times within this code compared to using two um, commands to, yeah. to, to split uh, the string, to you, to a, a, a computer in, in our day and age, it has zero impact, I'd say. Uh, whereas, of course, if you're working on a big cooperation or collaboration of, of a bigger thing, it's, of course, worth knowing if, if you're using this much CPU power or this much RAM or this much memory compared to doing it in a slightly better way. But for most of what it seems like auto hotkey is being used for, it I don't believe it matters. That, that's just, just saying that I have what I don't, I can't remember, but uh, tens of thousands of, of code in a program at the moment that, that I'm I'm have out there publicly, and it has well, it has a lot of includes. So I don't actually know the exact length of it, but it is 15 megabytes in size when it's compiled with Auto Hotkey. And I use whatever I feel like wh wherever, and it has no speed issue. It ha it doesn't seems to to impact any kind of CPU power on the machines in any way. And it goes, it has a good amount of backwards compatibility. So even on, on quite slow machines, it, it's still, it, it's no issue. So I don't really see it. This, by the way, Jackie, um, and I, I post a link to the video, but now that I think about it, let me, let me post a link to my site just because on my page, I actually documented um, I put some of my notes in there um, mm -hmm. on what they were doing, but this video, they talk through these guys. They were um, comparing, I forget how many names it was. It had to do with the, after nine 11, all the secure list and who's on the, on the no fly, like, you know, um, what do you call it? Terrorist watch list. Mm -hmm. And they had to bounce all these names off it. And they had a process. Let me see if I wrote it down up here. It used to take like two weeks to run. Maybe it was longer than that. Um, and then they kept trying to optimize it and they got it down to running to five minutes. Um, they got it down where it runs in five minutes. And so they optimized their stuff and they walked through in the video. I made notes on it because um, it was really brilliant how they kept thinking about different ways to optimize their code and different with things that, you know, they could throw more processor stuff at it, but that was going to be really expensive and not very efficient. And they just kept thinking about different ways to, to, to do what they were achieving and realized a lot of stuff they were doing with some different logic, they could actually rule out huge numbers of comparisons they didn't have to do. Um, mm -hmm. And anyway, it was a fascinating, it's a long video. Um, it's, it's 38 minutes long, but it, as a programmer, I'd say uh, uh, put it up in the background sometime and just listen to it and per periodically look, you don't really actually have to watch them. They don't really demonstrate much. Um, they give you a little stuff on the screen, but um, it was, it was fascinating listening to, um, what they went through to to find ways to optimize and and to jackie's point like when you're doing something like this where it, it takes you two weeks to run it definitely spend time to optimize <laughs> when yeah. you're doing something yeah that's 
it, it's done in the blink of an eye, why does it matter? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, again, it, it's fair enough to tell people about it, but, but maybe not to the degree of saying it's wrong to yeah. use one over the other. Yeah. Because, again, we are maybe not all hobbyists, but still the, the level of the stuff that Arahat Key is normally used for there's no reason to opt for one over the other. Um, I'd say maybe even opt for the function or the object oriented one here because it just um, makes the code simpler. That's, well, and, that's how I see it. Readability, right? It's, it's when I come back to it later or if someone else looking at it, as long as they understand how these work, which is actually, um, I think it was more a guy said, he, he didn't understand how that, that was working. It, it can be harder, right? But for anyone who does understand it, it's it's a lot easier to just spot it and go, okay, that's what, I don't have to look up what this variable, because in the other way, we would have had a variable, you know, that would have stored the value, and then we had, would look there at what it's doing. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm of course, I, I need to correct it because I said it made the code simpler. But yeah, again, with readability, sometimes it makes sense, even for, for oneself, to go in and, and split up, let's say, in a big expression, so you don't get these uh, very, very long, weird looking stuff where uh, a simple missed space or comma or whatever might actually give you more issues than you get from shortening down your code. So as you said, as you're writing already, Joe, just putting in the string split, putting in the text, and then instead you could have used text three, text one, text two, yeah, at the same places within the line below. You would have one extra line, and some would feel that you would have more readability. But again, it depends on the person reading it, because yeah. because when I read string split text space uh, dot three, I of course know what's happening. Yeah. And, and I've, I've gotten comfortable with reading that, but I also know that that's not very readable for someone who's completely new to code or out of key or whatever. So, so again, one makes sense in some cases and in others, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think we're also getting closer to the end of the second. Yep. Yeah, does anybody have any other questions or anything? I think we're good. Um, hopefully, so um, Jean Lalonde was going to present at this webinar on um, using SQL uh, with uh, SQL Lite 3 um, with Auto Hotkey. And uh, unfortunately, he is had to go on a trip, so he couldn't um, attend and present. So the next one will be on that. And um, I've been starting to use it a little bit. And it's been pretty awesome to be able to um, store data in a database. And then when I want it, I can run SQL on it and pull pull data out. Um, it's, it's really wicked cool. Um, I can definitely see how it will help me. Yeah, I'm even looking forward to it because I've, I've done it a few times when I had the need, but I haven't actually used it for my own mm -hmm. stuff, which, which um, with a short intro or whatever you'd call it, that he does. Yep. I'm pretty sure that, yeah, just talking about it, asking a few questions would actually. Yeah, it opens up a lot of doors. And if you have, even if you don't have a background in SQL, um, SQL is, is dirt simple to start learning how to use in, and for customizing a query. So you can store your data in the database and then easily pull out what you want. Um, and, and man, it's, it's so powerful, so. Yeah, that's the thing, it, it is, it, <laughs> not because normal files and stuff ain't databases, but SQL and stuff like that with a asynchronous calls and stuff. And it, you get a tool that, that really is quite powerful. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about it. All righty. Well, thank yeah. you, everyone. Um, it's been fun, and we'll see you next month. Um, bring a friend.
Yeah, <laughs> bring a friend. Yeah. yeah. Let, tell them we have beer. Tell, tell them there's beer here, and then you're like, it's a webinar. Yeah, I have one, and he has one, and yeah, you can look at it. No, that's fine. Yeah. Tell people whatever you like, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll. I'll. I'll um, try tonight or to, probably tonight because there's not a lot I can share. I'll, I'll get the videos online and I'll share whatever links I had um, in there in case you had questions about anything. But a lot of them I put in the chat already. So, absolutely awesome. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Yep. Yeah, bye.